Amen, amen, amen. How many feel the presence of God tonight? How many feel the King of kings and the Lord of lords is in the building tonight? And he's worthy of all of the praise, all of the glory, uh, all of the honor. Amen. I don't care how long I've been down. I don't care how long I've been out. I want to tell the devil and put him on notice uh, that we are back and God uh, is getting ready to do something. Uh, Woo, shata la bohota. Getting ready to do something in Stockton, California. Uh, and if you want to be a part of revival, uh, you showed up in the right year at the right time uh, in the right place. Woo, riata. Thank you, Jesus. If you have your Bibles, I'll move quickly. We got food after service. Amen. We got Chick fil A. Amen. We paid a lot of money for it. It's free. Free for everybody. So I'm asking, don't leave tonight. Uh, if you're, when you're done worshiping, go outside, get a Chick-fil-A sandwich and, and some food. I think we got root beer floats out there too, amen. We're calling this a welcome, to the sur uh, a welcome to the family service, amen, because college, homegrown, Stockton, Idaho, Sean, only, amen, Sean, praise God. One person from Idaho, amen. We're all family. We're all family in the body of Christ, amen. There's not you versus us. It's not we versus them, uh, but it's one spirit, one Lord, one baptism, amen. Praise God, praise God, praise God. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. I'm going to read down to verse 16, amen. I give honor to the choir. Didn't the choir do a great job, amen? Sister Michael and team have done a great job putting that together. Amen. I'll try not to be long, but I want to tell you, before this service is over, somebody's going to have the victory in Jesus' name, Amen. I felt the heavy burden that you walked onto this campus and into this room with. Uh, and I promise you, before this service over, that burden that you walked in. Ha, cha, ta. Woo, I feel the Holy Ghost so strong. Uh, that burden that you walked onto the campus with and into this building with, uh, it's going to begin to lift. Uh, not because you get something new, uh, but you're going to get a revelation uh, of what you already have. Amen. Praise God. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting with verse 14. It says, now thanks be unto God, which always, turn to your neighbor, say always, causes us to triumph. Turn to your other neighbor, say triumph, in Christ. Hey, I didn't tell you to do it, but you did it. Amen. Praise God. And maketh manifest the savor. Another word for that is fragrance. Makes manifest the fragrance of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God. A sweet savor of Christ. In them that are saved and to them that perish. To the one we are a savor of death unto death. And to the other savor of life unto life. Who is sufficient for these things. With the help of the Holy Ghost. I want to talk to you about how to act when you win. How to act when you win, with the help of the Holy Ghost, would you put your Bibles down, throw both hands up to heaven, uh, and I pray that the gift of faith would release in this building tonight. Uh, God, I pray that every person under the sound of my voice uh, would get a revelation, the revelation that you gave me of what you've already given us, Lord. We don't have to strive for a victory. You already gave us the victory. Uh, we don't have to strive to win the battle. Uh, you already won the battle for us. Uh, and Lord, I believe it's time for us to celebrate. Uh, I think it's time for us to celebrate uh, the battle uh, that you already won uh, lord that there's no more striving that there's no more fighting uh, but lord help us to enjoy uh, and to live in the victory Woo, shata la baha. clap your hands as you're seated tonight amen praise god praise god can can anybody give me 30 minutes tonight amen i want to let this congregation know i want to let people from all four corners of the nation maybe some foreign people that you are a part of a church that is a victorious church the captain of our church the head of our church jesus christ has never lost a battle you are part of the most powerful force that's ever existed on planet earth but since her inception the church of the living god has suffered many enemies attacks have come in all forms when we were first created on the day of Pentecost, we were called blasphemers. We were thrown into prison and beaten, and they thought they would stop us, but you know what? It seemed to have the opposite effect. Right when they beat us, uh, we just lifted our hands, uh, and we began to rejoice uh, that we were counted worthy uh, to suffer for his name. Uh, what they thought would shut us up uh, just turned into another opportunity to praise and worship God. 
When that didn't work, they tried to kill us with stones. And, you know, when they threw the stones at us, uh, we got a little bit scared. We fled, we fled to other cities. But the power of the Holy Ghost came upon us. Uh, and everywhere that we fled, uh, new churches started to be planted. Uh, even in running, we were doing the work of God. Uh, even in fleeing the attack of the enemy, uh, people were getting the Holy Ghost. Uh, people were getting saved. Uh, even when I was afraid for my life, uh, I was still teaching Bible studies. Uh, I was still knocking doors. Uh, because because you cannot stop the church of the living God. You can cause us to run. You can cause us to go underground. But we'll still win souls underground. We'll still win souls when there's nobody around us. I heard, I had a conversation. I had a conversation with the great man of God at Landmark, Brother Cunningham. He said that the Chinese church, it's a church that is underground. There's not one public church. Uh, it is growing by 50,000 members uh, a day. Uh, not per week, not per month, uh, but per day. Uh, they're underground. Uh, they have to do everything. He told me that in their services, uh, the way they would format their services is that they would all stand uh, and the preacher would stand in the middle of the congregation. So I would be standing somewhere in the middle just in case uh, the Chinese police were to come. Come in, huh? they wouldn't know who to shoot. Huh? And in that type of environment, huh? in that type of place, huh? God is still growing his church huh? because it doesn't matter what you do. Huh? Because Jesus prophesied it huh? many years ago huh? when he told his disciples in Caesarea Philippi, huh? he said, The gates of hell huh? shall not prevail huh? against the church. Huh? You are a part of church that cannot lose. Huh? You can beat us, huh? you can kill us, huh? you can whip us, huh? you can throw me in the dungeons but you can't stop the church of the living God you can cut my head off but where you cut my head off there's going to be five more that pop up just like me Woo! A man named Tertullian said this. Uh, he said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Uh, if you kill us, all you do is just grow ten more of us uh, because you can't stop the church of the living God. You're part of the most powerful force of all time. It's never died. Yeah. They got more gruesome. They killed us with swords. But God avenges people with the sword of the angels. And the word of God grew and multiplied. Their vicious attacks didn't stop there. They sent us to the guillotines. They sent us to the lions. Uh, they threw us naked in the cold to freeze. They burned us alive. They starved us. Uh, they tortured us. But it seems uh, that the harder they attacked us. Uh, there's a principle in the kingdom of God. Uh, that the harder the enemy attacks you, uh, the stronger God will make you. Uh, the stronger the enemy attacks you. I want you to get a revelation. Uh, so if you feel like all hell is breaking through in your life, uh, that means for every attack he throws at you. Uh, that's another stone uh, in your spiritual fortitude. Uh, that's another rock in your salvation. Uh, that's another. Uh, that's the Bible says that my faith uh, is going to be tried in the fire seven times. Uh, but when it comes out, uh, it will be as refined uh, as pure gold. Uh, so keep hitting me. Uh, you're just making me stronger. Uh, keep trying to kill us. Uh, quit. Keep trying to attack us. Uh, because I say, Isaiah said that no weapon uh, formed against me shall prosper. Uh, Brother Abrego, the enemy uh, has been forming new weapons for millennia. Uh, he doesn't attack with the sword anymore. Uh, you know what he attacks with? He attacks with the pen. Uh, or rather, I should say the keyboard. Amen. Uh, and he attacks the church. Uh, and he calls us hateful. And he calls us bigots. Uh, and he tries to intimidate us. Uh, but I want to tell you, the church uh, is not in trouble. Uh, the church of the living God. I didn't say Christian denominationalism isn't in trouble. I didn't say formal religion isn't in trouble. I didn't say that the Sunday morning only Christian isn't in trouble. But I want to tell you that the church of the living God, it's not in trouble. The apostolic church is stronger than it's ever been before. And you keep attacking us. And I want to preach victory to this congregation. You're not part of a weak body. You're not part of an anemic body. You are part of the most powerful force. So don't listen to what it says in the headlines. Don't listen to what it says in the news. God is only growing stronger in power. We're more stronger than we've ever been. I don't think that's the right way of saying that, but we're still more stronger. Amen. 
The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church as a twofold meaning. It means that the attacks of the enemy, but, but hell is also the place of the dead. So that the enemy isn't going to destroy, destroy us uh, and there's not going to be enough of us that die off. Uh, there's always going to be somebody that's breathing, uh, that's going to stand for this apostolic truth. Uh, there's always going to be somebody, uh, no matter how bad it gets or, or how bad the fight gets, is still going to stand up uh, because that's the power of the truth. He's tried it all. And it was like the Apostle Paul had a prophecy. He said in Romans chapter 8, verse 35, if you want to throw it up on the screen, he said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Hallelujah. He started to ponder a question, really, what is there in existence that's able to separate me, Brother Jason, from the love of God, from the power of the Holy Ghost? Is there any force in the universe that is powerful enough to take me away and to strip me away from the love and presence of God? And he started to say, shall tribulation, can you go through a tribulation, a trial that is so difficult that it pulls you from the clutches of God? He says, will distress or persecution or famine, they could take your food away, uh, or nakedness, uh, or peril, or sword. Uh, can any of these things take you from the presence of God? And he says this, as it is written, uh, for thy sake uh, we are killed all the day long. Uh, we are accounted as sheep uh, for the slaughter. How many of you can be honest uh, and say this is the way uh, you began the school year? Uh, that you feel like you're just a little lamb. Uh, that the reason you were bred uh, was that you would one day go to the chopping block. Uh, you're just waiting to fall. Uh, you're just waiting uh, for a trial big enough to come your way. Uh, you know it's just a matter of time. Uh, and the enemy wants to convince you uh, that you are weak. You've said things like there are people uh, that are so much stronger than me uh, that weren't able to... To keep the faith how am I going to keep the faith I want to tell you it's not by your strength that you're going to keep the faith it's not going to be by your mental acuity that you're going to keep the faith but he told you now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you blameless if you just put your trust in him whoa and the apostle Paul Begins to contemplate this. Sometimes we feel like sheep. Sometimes we feel like we're just getting set up to die. And he responds with one of the most fantastic responses I've ever heard in my entire life. He says in verse 37, he says, nay, in other words, this is never. He looks at all these situations and he says, never, nothing is going to be able to strip my faith from me. Nothing is going to be able to take me out of the presence of God and take me out of the love of God. And he uses this phrase. This is absolutely amazing. He said, in these things, we are more than conquerors. Everybody shout, more than conquerors. That wasn't shout. I want you to shout, more than conquerors. So, we are more than conquerors uh, through him that loved us. And Brother Abrego uh, came up to me on Sunday morning. Uh, and they sang the song about being more than a conqueror. Who was there on Sunday morning? Brother Silliman, the team, sang. And Brother Abrego, he, he looked at me and said, hey, what's it mean to be more than a conqueror? And I looked back at him and I said, I don't know. <laughs> but it sounds really good, you know. That's one of those things you shout about, but you don't know why you're shouting. You know what I mean? Like. I'm more than a conqueror. Whoa, what's it mean? I don't know. And so I looked it up for y'all tonight. And I want to tell you what. I lost my stuff when I looked up this verse. I, I lost my, this is when I called Brother Brego. I looked at, I dropped, I dropped my laptop. And I said, bro, I got to tell you this. Because God just gave me a revelation of what it means to be more than a conqueror. Check this out. Y'all going to love this. This is amazing. Give you a little Greek word study for a second, okay? The phrase more than a conqueror, I looked in the Greek, and it's actually those three words, excuse me, four words, is actually one word in the Greek. Now, listen to me because this is absolutely amazing. It's the word in the Greek for more than a conqueror is hooper nikau. Hooper nikau. I want you to understand this. This word is nowhere found in the New Testament or any other classical Greek writings. You know what that means? Is that when Paul was thinking about a word that would describe the church by the divine power of the Holy Ghost, he literally had to make up a word because there was no word in his vocabulary that would describe. It's nowhere else. You read your commentaries. The Bible says that Paul literally made up this word, coined this word. I think it was, I think it was the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And he started to think, 
think are we going to die are we going to get persecuted are we going to get separated from the love of god and he says no we're not and listen he began to describe so the second half of the word is nakao this word does appear 25 times in the New Testament, it literally means uh, to conquer or to prevail. Uh, but that word wasn't sufficient. Uh, when he thought, when he wanted to describe the victory of the church, uh, conquer wasn't strong enough. Uh, victory wasn't strong enough. Uh, that was below uh, what God has given the church. Uh, to say that you are a conqueror in all things uh, is below uh, what God's done for you. Uh, I want you to hear me in the Holy Ghost tonight. Uh, just to say that you're going to win uh, is so far below uh, what God did for you. Uh, just to say that you're going to make it. Uh, wow, that's below uh, what God did for you. Uh, if you're to stand up in faith uh, and say, I'm going to make it. Uh, I'm going to make it till tomorrow. Uh, you are downgrading uh, what God did for you. Because he didn't call you a conqueror. Woo, someone's going to lose it tonight. Ah, I feel like the devil's going to loosen his grip on you tonight. So the second half of the word, hooper, a cow, a cow. A cow means conqueror. Hooper is the word, oh my goodness, that we get for hyper. It's the same word. When we use the word hyper, what are we talking about? We talk about hypersonic speed. We talk about hyperactive. Sister Gianna said, amen, praise God. We don't, you're not just active, you're hyperactive. Oh, you're not just fast, you're hyper fast. You're not just full of speed. You're not just loud. You're hypersonic. The word hyper literally means over, beyond, reaching beyond the present situation. Literally, study it out if you think I'm lying. When Paul wanted to describe the church and describe the victory that he's given to your life, he said, you're a hyper conqueror. You're a, literally, one translation literally says you are a super conqueror because it was never god's will that you just crawl your way through life i wish i just had a few people that would really believe that the victory that god's given the church isn't so we just crawl past the finish line that we don't just drag our carcasses past the finish line but he's given you a victory that goes up beyond beyond above far reaching Woo! i'm not just going to have victory I'm going to have hyper victory i'm not going to have conquest i'm going to have super conquest because there's no weapon formed against me shall prosper jesus said whoa the thief cometh not but for to steal and kill and destroy jesus said for i am come that they might have life and they might have life where they just have barely enough i have come to give them life so they can cry themselves to sleep at night I have come to give them life uh, that they put the gun to their forehead, but you know they just don't pull the trigger. You feel that in the spirit right now? <sighs> spirit of suicide has become rampant in this generation. I didn't have any of this planned tonight, uh, but the enemy wants to destroy you because he's afraid of the victory that God has given you. You know what the spirit of suicide is? Sister Lauren, you want to know what the spirit of suicide is? Uh, the spirit of suicide uh, is Satan putting thoughts in your head uh, of what he would like to do to you. And we entertain them like they're our own thoughts. Uh, but these are demonic thoughts. Uh, that's why the Bible says, uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself. It is not a natural thing for someone to hate themselves. Uh, only Satan can propagate that type of thinking. Uh, because it's not a human natural emotion to hate yourself. Uh, that is demonic thinking. Because uh, because Satan hates you, uh, he wants you to hate you. Uh, so if you hate you, uh, if you don't like yourself, uh, that's not a God thought. Uh, and that's not even a thought from your own 
flesh. That's a thought directly from the throne of hell. And tonight, we are going to walk in victory. We are going to walk in victory. And not just victory. We're going to have hyper victory. We're going to have super victory. We're going to go above and beyond victory. I'm not going to stop at victory. I'm not going to degrade myself to victory because victory is the base. Victory is the bottom. I go above victory. I got more than victory. I got more Holy Ghost I need. God didn't give me, God didn't give me just enough Holy Ghost to make it through my trial. God didn't give me just enough Holy Ghost to, to make it through my circumstance. Woo. The Bible says now to him that giveth the Spirit without measure, it's exceeding abundantly above according to what we could ask or think. I think we need to stop about 10 seconds right there. Throw your hands up to heaven. In the Holy Ghost right now, I want to tell you, there are demonic spirits leaving the room right now. Right now. Because the devil doesn't want to be with when hun thousand feet of this building. Because all he has is intimidation. That's all he has. That's all he has. If you're, a, if you're a part of the church of the living God, all he has is intimidation. Now, if you're not a part of the church, he's the God of this world. He's got you right in his hip pocket. So if you're not a part of the church... You need to become a part of the church. And there's only one way to get a part of the church. Uh, Jesus said, unless a man, uh, I'm going to tell you the word tonight, uh, unless a man is born of the water uh, and of the spirit. John chapter 3, 3 through 5, you can read it if you want. Uh, unless a man is born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Uh, but when you get into the kingdom of God in another place, uh, he said the kingdom of God suffereth violence, uh, but the violent take it by force. Amen. Uh, when you enter the kingdom, uh, you walk out of the darkness uh, into his marvelous light. Uh, and all the enemy can do uh, is just yap in your ear. Uh, all the enemy can do is just yap in your ear uh, because he knows he's defeated. Uh, so all he has is his words. Uh, he knows he's lost. We're getting somewhere tonight. Sit down for just a second. Sit down for just a second. If you're praying, keep on praying. Amen. Praise God. I want to just tell you one more thing, and we're going we're gonna to lose it tonight, all right? I got 15 more minutes. Amen. All right. And so our text at the beginning, thanks be to God. I think I've laid a good foundation to help you understand this next concept. It says, thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in his name. And so what I've just told you about this passage, we always win. This passage has a lot more to do than just winning. So if you would understand the original reader, sometimes when you don't, this is why we go to Bible college, we can understand the original context of the scriptures. And the original readers would have fully understood, Sister Vanessa, what the author was taught, what Paul was talking about. But there's something lost in translation here. So when he talks about a triumph, look at your neighbor say a triumph. He's referring to a grand event in ancient Roman times. It's called a triumphal procession. A triumphal procession were done by the Caesars and the generals of Rome. And literally, the Greek definition of this word triumph, this is the literal most powerful definition I've ever read in my entire life. This is the definition of the word triumph. Properly to display triumph openly. Publicly exalting the victor who leads a victory procession and putting the conquered on display. It's an exhibition to show that the enemy has been totally defeated. So quite literally, when the Bible says he always causes us to triumph, Brother Sergio, the triumph isn't the victory. The triumph is the party you have after the victory. Man, if you would have got that, we could have lost the service right now. But let me tell you, 
Sit down just for a few more seconds. Let me describe triumphs for you a little while. They were so big. They were so massive that it was not awarded with every victory. Not every victory was rewarded with a triumph. The Senate of Rome, they had a democracy, uh, not like ours, but in a different way. They would have to vote if a victory was great enough to award a triumph. Only the most exceptional military victories were awarded with a triumph. Because the cost that was involved with the triumph. Literally, hear this. You could read about this all over. It's all over. It's all over academics. You can find it. The Roman economy... The triumphs were so big, Brother Abrego, that the Roman economy would literally take a hit in the following year. They were so rare. They didn't happen all the time. They were so rare that most Romans would have never seen a triumphal procession. Let me describe this triumphal procession for you for a moment. They would ride down the main street of the city of Rome. It was a 2.4 mile ride. And it took them because the party was so great and the party was so boisterous that it would take them four days to go 2.4 miles. Everyone and everything was decked out. They were decked out with fine jewels. They were decked out with precious metals. They only wore the finest of linen. And as they rode through the main street of that city, literally thunderous applause would erupt. People would erupt with, with, with clapping and joyous laughter because they were celebrating that there was a victory. And the victory was so great, it took them four days, sometimes five days, sometimes it only took two days. But the greater the victory, the longer the party was afterwards. Let me, talk, let me talk to you about the order of the triumphal procession. So literally, the first people that came out, Brother Aiden, in the triumphal procession were the captives that they took from the opposing side. And so right before all of the soldiers came in, you would see captives. You would see people that were bound in chains. And they were walking. And this was a symbol. These were the captives that we took. These are the, this is the enemy that we defeated. And I'm going to get to this in a minute there were two types of captives there would be those captives that would be saved and converted over to the victorious nation and then there was another group that was sentenced to death and they would walk down the streets of the city some were saved and others were executed and check this out servants would release massive amounts of fragrance. One of the biggest parts uh, of the triumphal procession uh, is they would release fragrances, uh, spices. Uh, it would be so great uh, that it would go for miles uh, and miles and miles. Uh, and before people could hear the clapping, uh, before people could hear the applauding, uh, they would start to smell uh, that there's been a victory that takes place. Uh, they would start to smell, uh, oh, something's in the atmosphere. Uh, I haven't seen the victory. Oh, but I could smell the victory. Uh, I know that something's coming. Brother Dan, come bring that up to me really quick. Then the allies would come. And then the soldiers would come. And then the triumph would end. Hear me in the Holy Ghost right now. This is so powerful. The triumph would end when the general, who was the star of the show, would come back on the scene. That's when the party would end. Because the party wasn't for the soldiers. The party wasn't for the captives. The party wasn't to celebrate my victory. The party wasn't to celebrate how hard I fought. But the party was to celebrate how great his victory was. The party was so great. And so what they would do, they would ride. It took them four days. Brother Brago, they would go about ten feet. And then they would say, hey, you remember when we took the bridge? And whoa, they'd have a party about taking the bridge. And they'd pull tables out. And they would eat feasts. And they would play games. And they would celebrate. And they'd take all the tables away. And they would take all the feasts away. And then they'd go about another ten feet. Hey, you remember when we killed the other general? And the people would say, hey, let's party again. And they took out the tables. And they took out the meat. And they took out, come on. I want to tell somebody tonight you need to learn to celebrate the victories that God has already done in your life 
You're waiting for God to do something new before you'll praise him. You're waiting for God to move heaven and earth before you'll praise him. You're waiting for God to break out before you'll praise him. But you need to learn to praise him for what he's already done. Hey, hear me in the Holy Ghost right now. Some of you owe back praise to the Lord for things he did in your life that you never recognized. You need to give back praise to the Lord for things that he kept you from, opportunities that he's made away in your life that you never lifted up the name of Jesus. You never thanked him properly. So why are you waiting for him to do something new if you haven't thanked him for something that he did old? Come on, just for 30 seconds, would you just begin to thank him all across the building? I'm gonna try to close this thing. Brother Brandon, Brother Dylan, get your teams up here. I'm gonna try to close this thing. I don't care what we do tonight, but we're gonna shout the house down for what God has already done. The victory that He's already won. I'm not gonna wait. And the greater the victory, the greater the party afterwards. I've got a revelation. I don't think you gotta dance like Brother Luke. Or Brother Timmy, I, I, think it, I don't think you got to be absolutely nuts to, wor you know, to be worshiping God. But I've got a revelation. If somebody doesn't worship God and doesn't praise God in their own way, granted, uh, they don't have a revelation uh, of the victory that's already been won. Because only people that win will celebrate. I've never seen a loser celebrate unless he was kind of twacked out in the head. And so for people, I'm not saying you got to make a fool of yourself just for the sake of making a fool of yourself. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to do emotionalism tonight. I'm not trying to get you to act up just to act up. But I'm telling you, if you never praise God, whether it's lifting your hands, whether it's tapping your foot, goodness gracious. If Jesus washed you in the blood, at least you could give him a foot tap. That's it. But you know what? There's sometimes that praise and that worship starts in the flesh. What I mean by that? I don't really feel like it, but I'm, I, you know, I'm going to dance anyways. You know, I didn't really come in feeling like praising. You know, I've, I've kind of had a bad day, but I'm going to do it anyways. When you do that, you're making praise predicated on how you feel. That means if I'm feeling good, I'm going to praise him. If I'm having a good day, I guess he's worthy. But then you come on in. David said, I read it this morning. It just knocked me, Brother Abrego. He was, he was getting punished for numbering the people, and he said, I'm going to offer a sacrifice. And he went to a dude and said, dude, let me buy your field. And dude said, no, nah, no, nah, fam, you can have it. Quote, unquote, that's what he said, right? He said, nah, fam, you can have it. And David's like, nah, I'm not going to offer the Lord something that didn't cost me anything. The Bible talks about a sacrifice of praise. I don't know if I got real theology for this, Brother Aiden. You can correct them later. But I think praise really starts to mean something when it starts costing you something. I think praise is at its most valuable when you don't feel like it. I think praise and worship is most valuable when all hell's breaking through in your life. Oh, hallelujah. Okay, check this out. Check this out. So, this is powerful. The captives came through. And so I used to always think that the, it says that we are the fragrance of Christ to them that are believing. 
So when you talk about the procession, one of the key elements of the procession was the fragrances that was released. And the fragrances would go so far, people would start to smell. There's a victory. And so when we first are introduced into the body of Christ, we were the captives. And we come out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then you come into a church service. And there's Brother Brock just losing his mind for the Lord. There's Brother Dayo just running the aisles. Uh, Sister Cassie's losing her stuff for the Lord. Uh, and you start to get a little smell. You know what that smells like? That smells like life. You know what? I came in all messed up. I came in all beat up. I came in still addicted to drugs. I came in still addicted to marijuana. But I see somebody that used to be an addict. I see Brother Sergio used to be on drugs on the streets, uh, losing his mind for the Lord, uh, and I get a fragrance in my nostrils that there is life. Oh, come on. So listen, I got, I'm use an illustration tonight. Sister Jasmine Tuala. Let me borrow some cotton candy champagne. Amen. Now, this is a non-alcoholic cotton candy champagne, okay? It's, it's from Bath and Body Works, okay? It's about to smell like Christmas up in here, all right? I'm giving y'all a warning. This first thing, it says that the, when the fragrances were released, the first, you know the first person? Oh, this is so powerful. You know the first person that smells the victory? You know the first, man, that smells like cotton candy. Goodness gracious. You know the first person that smells the victory? It says you are a fragrance unto God. And so when you begin, now your whole life is a fragrance, don't get me wrong. But when you begin to praise and worship, that fragrance goes up to heaven. And God looks down, and you know what he smells? The Bible says you are the fragrance of Christ. And so when he looks down on your worship and your praise, you know what he smells? He smells the blood of Jesus. You know what he smells? He might look at your life, you're beat up, you're messed up, you're tore up from the floor up. But when you begin to release that fragrance, God says, all right, I remember the blood. All right, I remember the victory. All right, I remember what I did on Calvary. All right, I remember what I did for my people. That's why it says God inhabits the praises of his people. You begin to praise. <laughs>